The Department of Public Health and Human Services is pleased to bring you Aging Horizons. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Fraud, Legal Issues, Veterans Benefits and Caregiving. Aging Horizons is a program dedicated to inform and prepare Montanans on these timely issues, making a difference to you and your loved ones. Here now is today's program host. Today on Aging Horizons, we'll be speaking with Kurt Almy. He's a U.S. Attorney for the state of Montana. We're going to be talking about meth in Montana and its relation to violent crime. We're going to be talking about the opioid epidemic. And we're going to talk about senior financial exploitation. We're going to discuss what the U.S. Attorney's Office is doing about all of these issues and what you can do to stay involved and stay uh, committed to your community. Stay tuned today on Aging Horizons. Did you just text me? I didn't want to disturb you if you were sleeping. Sleeping? I'm sitting right next to you, silly. There you are. Hey, I found a couple of Medicare helping programs online that I think we ought to look into. Hmm. It says if we qualify, we can get help paying for our prescription drugs. Oh, and there's a program that can help pay our Part B premium. To learn more about extra help and Medicare savings programs, call your local ship counselor today. Maybe I better text him. I was outside working on some equipment, nothing too strenuous. I started sweating and feeling out of breath. When he felt pressure in his chest and aching in his arms, I knew we had to call 911. First responders were there before we knew it. 38 minutes later, the doctors had restored the blood flow to my heart. Now we know dialing 911 saved his life. Your life is on the line. This message sponsored by Mission Lifeline Montana. Elder abuse is a growing problem, and it's happening right here in our Montana communities. At least one in ten older adults are victims of physical or emotional abuse, financial exploitation, or neglect. To get help or report elder abuse, call your local area agency on aging or Adult Protective Services at 1-844-277-9300. Sometimes the difference between having the life-saving medications you need and going without is the premium on your Medicare drug insurance. If you are a Montana resident enrolled in the Medicare Prescription Drug Program, you may be eligible to receive help with your premiums, even if you own your home or other assets or think you may have too much income. Call or visit the Big Sky RX website today to find out if you qualify. There you go, ma'am. See you next month. Thank you. Welcome to Aging Horizons. I'm your host, Katie Lovell. Aging Horizons is brought to you by the Department of Public Health and Human Services. And today we're at the 51st Governor's Conference on Aging, and we're speaking with Kurt Almy. He's the U.S. Attorney for the State of Montana. Kurt, thank you so much for being here today. So let's talk first about meth in Montana. I know it's a huge problem, and your office is doing so much to combat the issue here in Montana. Meth is a serious problem in Montana. Katie, it's the number one substance abuse problem that we have. It's causing a host of issues from foster care to filling our hospitals, overwhelming our foster care facilities, our treatment facilities, our criminal justice system, causing violent crime, causing property crime. And meth use, is it going down, is it going up, is it a bigger problem than it used to be? Meth is a much bigger problem than it used to be. About 2013 or 2014, meth began to sweep across the state and use has increased and one of the major issues our office is dealing with is the related violent crime that's come from that increased use. Sure. I remember growing up meth use was something you talked about in meth labs blowing up all across communities. Is that still how meth is coming into Montana? Is it still homegrown or is it coming from Very different. Else? Very different. In back last decade meth used to be made in bathtubs in Montana. Sure. Very low quality, low quantity. Now it's very high purity, high quantity meth coming from the Mexican drug cartels coming up through the western United States and into Montana. That's terrifying. And um, what makes this type of meth more dangerous? It seems like it's the increasing in rates of use. What is it about this Mexican meth that's more, more dangerous? The high purity levels okay. make it more dangerous and the fact that it's more widespread than it used to be. So what we're seeing is dealer on dealer violence. So dealers who are committing violent acts against people they're collecting debts from or robbing other dealers. We're seeing armed robberies increase in armed robberies of casinos, convenience stores, and other people to get meth to, uh, or to get money to buy meth to either use or sell. Sure. And then finally, we're seeing an increase of meth users 
who become paranoid and aggressive and tend to commit violent, some commit violent acts against other people. Okay, so that's meth's relation to violent crime. Can you just explain, when we talk about violent crime as a, as a, as a category, what does violent crime mean? So violent crime is murder, aggravated assaults, rape and robbery is what we're talking about. We've seen violent crime increase by over 35% in Montana from 2013 to 2017. We now have the second highest violent crime rate in the continental Northwest. That's terrifying. I think people always think of Montana as such a safe, safe place and our crime rights are going up, you're saying. They have been through 2017. Uh, we're hoping we're going to turn that down through the law enforcement efforts that we're going uh, undergoing as well as some of the meth prevention and treatment efforts that are going on in the state. So I know one of those prevention tactics is the Project Safe Neighborhood, correct? Can you explain that to me a little? Project Safe Neighborhood is a federal program, U.S. Department of Justice program. It's been around for a long time. It's been reinvigorated and U.S. attorneys around the country have been encouraged to focus on reducing violent crime in their districts, which is just what our district, what our state needs. Sure. So we've been working with the state attorney general's office, all of our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners to target meth traffickers, armed robbers, violent felons with firearms, and trying to get these violent individuals off the street and interrupt the supply of meth. You've had some amazing success in Yellowstone and Missoula County, so you've had um, if I copied this down from your sites, right, 429 prosecutions in Yellowstone County alone in that in that time period, and that I assume is an increase in prosecution. 429 is actually the statewide number. Okay. But we've had uh, almost 240 in Yellowstone County alone, and another 58 in Missoula County, but the others are across the state. But we're focusing on those efforts statewide. We're really focusing on Yellowstone County and Missoula County, as you mentioned, because those counties had suffered the most serious increases in violent crime. Okay, and those prosecutions and the arrests made through those this this project have taken an enormous amount of meth off the streets in Yellowstone County. I, I think your site said 267 pounds of meth. That's amazing. Almost a million doses have been taken off the have been taken off the street with a street value of almost 12 million dollars. And that's had some really big impacts on crime rate statistics, correct? These efforts have had good results. We had, I think, almost 16 percent increase and then almost a 26 percent increase in violent crime in Yellowstone County in the two years prior to starting Project Safe Neighborhood here. After starting, uh, the crime only increased 1.3 percent in Yellowstone County, so hopefully we're bending that crime curve down right. and hopefully we can get on top of it. In Missoula, we've been more successful. Uh, I think three years ago they had a 21 percent increase in violent crime and the growth was starting to slow but then when we started Project Safe Neighborhood it dropped 18 percent and it's continuing to drop in Missoula County. That's outstanding especially for the those two counties that we saw such huge rates of crime increase. So in prevention is certainly one area that, that the project focuses on or the, the prosecution but then there's the second side which is the prevention and that's done through access to treatment. Can you talk a little bit about that? You bet. So we know that law enforcement can't do this on its own. This meth problem is too big. We all have to work together. So while law enforcement has been working on the enforcement side to reduce supply, we've also been working with Yellowstone Substance Abuse Connect in Yellowstone County, drug courts, uh, and federal grants across the state to try to support prevention and treatment efforts. Yellowstone County got off the ground first. We have 82 organizations already a part of Yellowstone Substance Abuse Connect. That's the city government, that's the county government, that's the courts, that's law enforcement, treatment providers, other nonprofits as well as state agencies all working together to come up with a prevention and treatment plan by the end of this year. That's wonderful. And Kurt, you gave three really good takeaways from your presentation. Um, the first was don't start and then intervene with families and friends and then if you see something, say something. Would you just, it, did I sum that up correctly? You got it perfectly. Yep, if, you, if you're thinking of starting, don't. If you have a family or friend who's using, get them help. There is help for them. And if you see a crime, uh, say something and we'll do something. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And when we get back, I'd like to talk a little bit about opioid use in Montana because I know that's another huge problem behind, right behind meth. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Katie. Make sure you stay tuned. When I stopped showing up, Jim showed up at my door. He took me to the hospital in town to get me help. That's the day Jim saved my life. Everyone has a role to play in preventing suicide. Know the signs and don't be afraid to speak up. If someone you know is in crisis or emotional distress, 
The only wrong thing to say is nothing at all. Call 800-273-TALK or text MT to 741-741. Questions about Medicare and other types of insurance? Contact the State Health Insurance Assistance Program Office to get answers to questions like, what is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? And how do you decide if you need Medicare supplemental insurance? This insurance counseling program is not a sales program. It is available to provide answers to your insurance questions. For more information, call the State Health Insurance Assistance Program Office at 1-800-332-2272. I have so many questions about power of attorney. Well, some powers of attorney are for finances and others are for healthcare decisions. A power of attorney designates an agent who would make decisions on your behalf. While making a power of attorney, you have the ability to control your agent's power. You also have the ability to decide when that POA would take effect. Wait, am I giving away all my rights? Power of attorney isn't a license to make any decision for you, just those that you've specified. Your agent should be somebody that's working in your best interest, but it should also be somebody that you would trust. What if they try to abuse their power? Protective measures like third-party accounting, secondary signatures, defined spending and gifting limits can help protect against financial exploitation. An agent's powers can always be limited by a customized power of attorney, and they can be revoked by you or the court if the power of attorney is abused. So carefully drafted estate planning documents can help ensure that your finances are monitored but not abused. If you or someone you know is being exploited, please report to Aging Services Bureau at 844-277-9300 or the legal service developer at 1-800-332-2272. This message is sponsored by the DPHHS Aging Service Bureau. Welcome back to the 51st Governor's Conference on Aging. We're speaking with Kurt Almy here on Aging Horizons today. Kurt, thank you again for being with us today. I want to talk about the opioid crisis. I think that's something that's getting a lot of press nationwide, but in Montana we're having issues as well. Is that correct? We are. We have a serious opioid problem. It is a threat to Montana. Not the same threat that methamphetamine is, thank goodness, but opioids are still causing serious problems in the state. When we talk about the opioid crisis, what kind of drugs are we talking about? I think there are, you said, three different categories? There are. So, you know, the first one is prescription pills, and we've talked a lot about that. Those are, are uh, pills that people get from their doctor, their pharmacist. But there's also heroin and there's also synthetic opioids and those are sold by drug trafficking organizations similar to cocaine and methamphetamine. So heroin is out there in a growing threat and so are synthetic opioids like fentanyl, carafentanyl, RU47700, a whole host of chemically made opioids. And where are these opioids coming from? Where do people get access to these types of drugs? So for pills, of course, they're accessible through the medical system. Okay. And people get them through doctors. Uh, as far as overuse of opioids, doctor shopping, prescription fraud, ordering over the dark web on the internet, um, theft is where people are getting them for illegal use. Sure. Heroin and fentanyl are being purchased on the street through drug trafficking organizations just like other drugs. I didn't realize uh, in your presentation that people were making carfentanil and fentanyl. I didn't realize that that was something that was now happening through the cartel network. Yes, the, the synthetic opioids are, are uh, the elephant just outside the room, so to speak. We've certainly had fentanyl and carfentanil in Montana, and they're so dangerous, as you know. You know hundred times, uh, fentanyl is a hundred times more potent than morphine and carafentanil is 10,000 times more potent. So very potent drugs, very lethal drugs. They're driving the overdose death rate that we're seeing across the United States. But those synthetic opioids that used to come in from Southeast Asia and come in through the mail are now being made by Mexican cartels and are coming across the same distribution networks across our southern border into the United States. That's terrifying. What a huge threat looming over our, our, our populace today. It sure is. The synthetic opioids, because of their potency, are particularly dangerous. One of the things I was glad to see in your presentation is that there's we've gotten a decrease in opioid deaths, overdose deaths in the last few years, and it's going down by, I think you said, about 5%, so that, that seems like good news, at least on the horizon. It is. That is good news. In 2018, the early data from the Center for Disease Control is that for the first time in years, our overdose death rate has gone down by about 5%. 
in Montana, we're sort of on, uh, we go against national data, and that our overdose deaths are still primarily or or, or meth more than uh, opioids. Is that correct? Yeah, we have we have a pretty diverse cause of overdose deaths with meth and with opioids, all causing uh, overdose deaths. But you know, rest of the country, opioids are much more of an overdose threat in Montana because meth is so widely used. We still have a lot of meth overdoses. Absolutely, and. Uh, one of the tactics that we talked about or you talked about in your presentation was pill diversion. Can you explain sort of what that topic means or what that, that phrase means, pill diversion? Right. That's people getting pills who shouldn't get them. Okay. So they may be doctor shopping where they'll take a prescription and go to multiple, well they may go to multiple physicians to try to get a prescription. Once they get a prescription they may go to multiple pharmacies to try to fill it more than once or they may just fraudulently create a prescription and try to go to pharmacies to get their prescription filled. So various ways that people use the legitimate medical system to try to get pills illegally. One of the ways your office is working to address the opioid crisis is the Montana Healthcare Fraud Task Force. Can you explain sort of what that task force does? You bet. We started that task force a year ago with assistance from the FBI and the State Attorney General's Office, the State Auditor's Office, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, and the DEA Tactical Diversion Squads. And that group meets to look into health care fraud, particularly around Medicare and Medicaid, but one of their primary focuses is looking at opioid uh, diversion and uh, misuse. Okay. And then one of the bills passed last legislative session, House Bill 86, does a lot of really cool things that are hoping uh, to decrease the opioid epidemic. Can you explain that? You bet. want to congratulate the medical uh, community as well as the legislature in passing that bill uh, by requiring individuals to show ID when they go fill their prescription. Uh, restricting the the quantity of opioids that are given to a first-time user and also requiring all providers to use the physician or, or the prescription drug registry to be sure people aren't filling prescriptions more than once will all be good steps that have been proven across the country to reduce uh, pill misuse. Absolutely help decrease that pill diversion problem that we'd had. That's wonderful. Sure. And um, one of the things that you talked about in your program was these DEA take back days where people can turn in prescription medication. I know I have some sitting at home from a surgery that I just haven't known what to do with. Can you tell me a little bit about those? You bet. October 26th, if not before, everyone who has opioids in their medicine cabinet they're not using should take them down to the local police department, local pharmacy, uh, adult protective services, the hospital, and get rid of them. What we've discovered is that more than half of opioid users first tried opioids because they were given pills by family or friend. We have to get these pills out of the medicine cabinet so they don't get stolen, they don't get misused by kids, they don't get misused by uh, people breaking into homes or friends who go into who go in and, and do pill seeking behavior and get these pills. We got to get them out of medicine cabinets and get them destroyed. And if we can do that, uh, that's the the gateway entryway for opioid sure. misuse. We can slow down the number of people who are beginning to use opioids. Absolutely. You had those wonderful takeaways for meth. Did you have one or two for the opioid crisis? That you well, the main one you just said, and that is get those prescription pills out of our medicine cabinets. Get them destroyed. It's you know good trends. Uh, for people to, I think we're seeing a change in how we uh, approach pain. Um, you know, it used to be that I think none of us wanted to experience pain at all, and we were willing to take the risk of opioids to do that. I think with good advice from our medical community, I think we're all learning that maybe sometimes a, a little pain, if it's tolerable and functional, is okay. That's wonderful. Kurt, thank you so much for that. And next we're going to talk about senior financial exploitation. I think kind of a lead-in for both of those topics, meth and opioid crisis sometimes are big contributing factors to financial exploitation. So make sure you stay tuned, you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. No one likes to have to ask for help. It's a courageous act. Sarah Solomon, Energy Share Coordinator. Our clients work hard, sometimes at two or even three jobs, but still struggle to keep the heat on. They're doing everything they can. They're proud and they don't give up. I feel inspired and honored to work together with these Montana families. To donate, call 888-779-7589 or go to EnergyShareMT.com. Energy Share, you can help your neighbor stay warm. If the aging network in Montana was a restaurant, the sign out front would say over 50 million meals served over the last 30 years. Since adequate nutrition is critical to health and quality of life, Nutrition services are an important factor in keeping older Montanans healthy, independent, and living in their community and home. 
To find out more about senior nutrition programs in your area, call 1-800-551-3191. Here in Montana, we love our outdoor activities. Unfortunately, few of them are risk-free. Indeed, Montana is second in the nation per capita in head injuries that can destroy the lives of people we love. That's why you should insist your family always wear protective helmets. But you can do even more. When you fill out your vehicle registration this year, circle the Y and donate a dollar to support traumatic brain injury prevention and education. Now that's using the old noggin. With as many as 1 in 10 Americans at risk for Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, chances are someone you know and love will receive that diagnosis. When that happens, you may well feel devastated, but know that you are not alone. Help is available. You don't have to face dementia by yourself. Call the free 24-7 Alzheimer's Association helpline, 800-272-3900, for guidance and support. Welcome back to Aging Horizons. We're here at the 51st Governor's Conference on Aging, and we're talking to Kurt Almy, a U.S. Attorney for the state of Montana. Kurt, thank you again for being here. Let's talk about senior financial exploitation. Uh, in my experience, and I think probably in yours, meth and opioid crisis have a lot to do with this topic because that's where some of this exploitation starts sometimes. Is that correct? It sure does. We, we uh, have a lot of seniors who as they tend to get isolated, uh, can become uh, substance abuse users, particularly opioid users, and that's certainly fed by the amount of chronic pain that we all, ex a lot of us experience as we get older. Sure. So we're going to be likely exposed to opioids more, and the risk of developing a substance abuse problem can increase. And I think the U.S. Attorney's Office has done a great job nationwide of sort of leading the charge and making senior financial exploitation a really important issue. And then Montana has followed suit in that and making it sort of one of your target goals. Why is that? Yep. So the U.S. Department of Justice has made this a nationwide goal for all U.S. attorneys across the country. And the reason for that is because of the demographics, uh, aging demographics, and also because the um, amount of crime and neglect that we all are aware about. Uh, Katie, you're, you're very aware, I know, that Montana has uh, tied with Maine and Florida for the highest percentage of seniors yeah. in the country. And the number of seniors that we have in Montana is only going to continue to grow over the next two decades. Sure. It's not only do we have a high percentage of seniors, but we have a high percentage of isolated seniors or elder orphans. Mm -hmm. We've seen statistics that Montana may be the sixth highest in the country for seniors who live alone. And people who live alone can get isolated and can become vulnerable, as you're well aware. The national statistics show that between 10 to 14 percent of seniors are victimized either through financial exploitation, elder abuse, or neglect every year. Absolutely. Which makes yeah. me think that it probably is the most underreported crime in America. Sure, absolutely. And elder exploitation has so many effects on seniors. Everything from uh, access or decreased food security, skipping meals because they no longer have the funds to do so. What sort of areas are is your office looking at in particular? So the, uh, from the federal point of view, our approach really is on the financial exploitation of the elderly because of our jurisdictional issues. Adult sure. Protective Services, uh, state law enforcement, local law enforcement have jurisdiction over elder abuse. We have more of a focus on financial exploitation of the elderly, phishing schemes, water holding schemes, phone schemes, sure. those kind of things that cross state lines are areas where the FBI in particularly has taken leadership and our office is interested in prosecuting cases. Now I will caveat that in Indian country, if we have physical abuse on our reservations of Native Americans, we want to be sure that our Native American uh, friends and neighbors report that to local law enforcement and to the BIA so we can be sure that those situations get addressed. Absolutely. I think one of the most interesting and exciting developments in, in the realm of the uh, elder exploitation is the development of these FAST teams across the state. And for the life of me, I've now forgotten what FAST uh, stands for. Can you talk about the FAST team? You bet. And glad that we're starting a, a team down here in Billings first. Uh, but it's a collection of law enforcement and public health professionals, legal professionals, uh, service professionals who are going to try to be ready and on call. So when we have physical abuse or neglect or we have financial exploitation, you can make a call to one location and and uh, and whoever is being victimized of whatever the issue is, we can get them in the hands of the right people 
and try to get that problem resolved. Absolutely. Brings all of the expertise to one table to work together collectively. Tremendous, tremendous idea. We know it's worked well across the country. Understand their goals are not only to facilitate investigations and prosecutions, but also to educate the community so that neighbors can look after neighbors and friends can look after friends. And particularly our professional community can look after their clients. Absolutely. And we can uh, be sure that this type of exploitation is, is addressed. Kurt, one of the things I think uh, is always so helpful in, in your presentation and presentations I've seen is recognizing the signs of exploitation that we may be missing in our friends, our neighbors, our community members. Can you tell me a few of the ones that you find most helpful? You bet. So if, you're, if you are watching your friends and your neighbors, look for isolation. Okay. Are they getting isolated and are they being isolated by someone in particular? Are there unpaid bills? Do they look healthy? Do they look like they're eating? Sure. Um, do they have mail that's not being addressed? Do Is there a change in their life pattern or their lifestyle? Do they seem depressed? Do you notice substance abuse issues? Notice of any kind of change in the ordinary, but particular where they are being isolated, they are isolated or being isolated by a particular individual. That's an area we all have to be vigilant about as we're watching our our friends and neighbors. Absolutely. And then when we see these signs and our friends, our neighbors, who, where do we go? Where do we, who do we contact? Who do we reach out to? So we're going to have hopefully some phone, a phone number for a FAST team here pretty soon, Okay. Uh, both in Billings and in other communities around the state. But until then, reach out to Adult Protective Services, okay. or you can call local law enforcement. And if, and if it's on one of our reservations, call local law enforcement or the BIA. There's also a tremendous resource out there that the FBI has available. It's IC. Gov, the letter I, the letter C, the number three, dot gov. The FBI has spent a lot of time on this issue. You can report a financial exploitation crime there, but also there are a lot of resources available for people to learn about exploitation, what it is, and what they can do to address it. Absolutely. That's so important because, uh, like you said, under-reporting of this crime is one of the things that leads to not enough resources, not enough training, and it's so important to to be publicizing that collection of data. Well said, Katie. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, Kurt, is there a way that uh, law enforcement, is there, are there trainings being pushed out by your office, things that you're being involved with in that way? Uh, there's trainings is, uh, being put out around the state, not necessarily by our office, but our office is participating in them. You know, here we're at the Governor's uh, Conference on Aging, sure. and then Adult Protective Service regional meetings, I know, uh, will have occasionally have a public component, as will uh, some of the elder uh, groups around the, the state. So people can keep their eyes open. I think we have them at least every week or two. So uh, coming to a community near you, people should look for those opportunities. Wonderful. Kurt, you and your office have been such a great partner in this work and I just want to thank you for everything you've done. It's been really wonderful to get to learn from you and get to just share all of this with our listeners today. So Thanks, thank Katie. You so You're much doing a tremendous here. job. Thank you. Yeah. Special thanks to the Department of Public Health and Human Services for their continued support. Hosts on Aging Horizons are program specialists at the Montana Office on Aging. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions. For more information about Aging Horizons, call the Department of Public Health and Human Services toll-free at 800-332-2272.